I can hear you, yes. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz on this chilly Thursday, November 7th. Coming up on the program, a shared city street for vehicles, bicycles and pedestrians. 25 years of Chicago's bloodshot records. Can the Bears stop their slide against the Detroit Lions? And the story of a former Illinois official who stole $53 million from the town. But first tonight, it's been rumored and now it's official. Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson will retire at the end of this year. He made his announcement this morning at Chicago Police Headquarters, flanked by family members and Mayor Lori Lightfoot, celebrating what he says has been a reduction in crime on his watch. And it's with that in mind that I want to announce my retirement today. It's time for someone else to pin these four stars to their shoulders. These stars can sometimes feel like they're carrying the weight of the world. But I'm confident that I leave CPD in a better place than when I became superintendent. And Johnson just finished up an event at the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, hosted by our very own Brandis Friedman. Amanda Vinicky joins us now from Hyde Park with the latest on that. Amanda. Paris, yes, that event did just end, so if you hear any bumping behind me, it is because breakdown is occurring right now. Johnson said that he is mentally in a good place with his decision to step down. He says it is time to be with his family. The job has taken a toll not just on him, but it has taken a toll on his relatives as well. He went to London to watch the Bears play, and that was, he says, in part when he realized how great it was to spend time with his loved ones. He does say that a culture change is taking place at the Chicago Police Department. Often, he says, rank and file police officers. He was once a homicide detective on the west side and encountered a lot of trauma himself. He says they're often in a rock and a hard place. He says he tells them just because you see a black boy with dreadlocks and his pants down doesn't mean that he's a gangbanger, and yet, that is where in areas that are disproportionately made of minority residents is where there is also a disproportionate amount of crime. He says officers know very quickly within 30 seconds of a conversation if somebody is just trying to fit in and get by in a neighborhood like Cabrini Green had been when he grew up there or whether they are a quote unquote gangbanger and one of those bad guys. He said that he pushed back on criticism like he got today, including from the ACLU, that the CPD disproportionately stops African Americans. Well, we have to look at the victimization of, of people of, uh, that have been victimized by crime. When you look at that and look at where the crime predominantly occurs in our city, it's predominantly on the south and west side. And unfortunately, those places are occupied mostly by African-American people. So if they're giving us those descriptions of African-Americans, then who, why would we stop a white guy? 
Now, Paris, the superintendent came in at a tough time just after the public release of the Laquan McDonald video, which Johnson was asked about his reaction to when he first saw it. He said he was troubled by it, but he hadn't really gotten the full story until the public did. He did call it disturbing. He said when he took over one of his first priorities, really his main priority was repairing relations with the minority community residents of Chicago, but also with the rank and file. He said that that is some of the advice that he will give to whoever takes his place, this next superintendent. You need to talk to people, both the officers and residents. You need to listen to them. Paris, I know you spoke with Johnson earlier. Amanda, I did, and Amanda, Johnson took over in April, as you know, April of 2016, amid the fallout from the release of the Laquan McDonald shooting video. Homicides spiked that year to 746, a 37% hike over the year before. They fell to 640 in 2017, 547 in 2018, are, and are at 447 to this point this year, on pace to hit around 480. And in a one-on-one -on -one interview this afternoon, Superintendent Johnson told me that he attributed the drop in crime to 1,000 new hired officers, better training, and better technology. But he said, as you kind of alluded to, Amanda, his first job when he took over was to heal and restore the community's faith in the police and police officers' faith in the job. For those first eight months, I was either with the community or the rank and file, trying to build them up. The relationship between the black and brown community came back with the police. So a lot of those communities are partnering with us now because those communities don't want to see lawlessness in their neighborhoods. They just don't. They just didn't know if they could trust the police. And now we've done a better job of, of inoculating our officers and, and just letting them have the resources and the tools that they need. You have to train them up better. You can't just stick them in a neighborhood with a different culture and expect that they know how to deal with it. So we've rolled out all that type of training. And you can watch the full interview online in which he addresses the night he was found slumped over in his vehicle, now the subject of an inspector general investigation, his reaction when he saw the Laquan McDonald video for the first time and advice for his successor. But Johnson told reporters today it wasn't the IG investigation that prompted his decision to retire. He says he first knew that he wanted out in September while attending a memorial for fallen police officers. The mayor and I was sitting next to the waterfall when I sat down in that seat, I leaned over to her and whispered in her ear, we got to start talking about an end date for me. Because that, I... Losing those officers. Hard. So that's when I started thinking about it. And Amanda, give us a little more on the reaction to today's retirement announcement. There were no tears from Johnson at this event tonight, though he was reflective. He talked about how actually he had first been a pre-med student, that he'd always had an easy time with school until he uh, had witnessed or known someone who had been a victim of a crime, murdered and raped, and that changed his trajectory. He was asked by members of the audience here at the University of Chicago about things like what is at the root of so much crime in Chicago. Johnson said more than anything, he's asked about what is going on with Chicago, Illinois having strict gun laws and yet so many guns in the city. He said the difference between Chicago and cities like New York and Los Angeles, well, that were bordered by states like Wisconsin and Indiana. So he literally talked about people being able to take a duffel bag of guns over the border and then selling them to criminals. He advocated at that point for universal background checks. The crowd here also applauded when he was asked a question about not attending that recent speech by United States President Donald Trump. The superintendent said he got pushback for that, but again, the crowd here liked it. They, they applauded right there. Now, Johnson said that he is going to be actually disappointed by one aspect of leaving the job in January, and that is he will not be around for the full rollout of the consent decree that will govern the department going forward. He says that is going to make the CPD better. It will make officers less of enforcers and more the guardians of public trust that they are meant to be. Now, Fraternal Order of Police leadership sees it differently. They've fought against that consent decree.
The superintendent and I have disagreed on many occasions, okay, and we have agreed to disagree. Uh, there has always been a dialogue, and I will tell you that uh, the superintendent has spoken to me uh, for the last few days we have, we have spoken. So uh, I, there has always been a dialogue, and I certainly hope that the next superintendent still has that dialogue uh, with the FOP, and uh, I, w I wish him the best. Johnson says that he's had a good relationship with Mayor Lori Lightfoot, considers her a friend. Aldermen generally have also said that they're impressed with the job that Johnson has done. Many of them talking about the desire to promote somebody from within the ranks of CPD. Now that certainly is possible. We don't quite know who the mayor is considering for that position, but some of the people whose names have been bandied about include Detectives Chief Melissa Staples within the CPD, also Barbara West. She is with the organizational department of the Chicago Police right now, as well as former chiefs of police for the departments in Seattle and Los Angeles. Ultimately, though, Paris, that is a decision that will be made by Mayor Lightfoot herself, something that she, of course, has gone through because she was head of the police board when it forwarded candidates to then Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who ultimately chose Johnson for that position instead. Back to you. Amanda, thank you very much. Mayor Lightfoot says she will announce her plan to fi find an interim successor in the coming days. And whenever there is a permanent replacement, that person will take over a police department that is under a federal consent decree to institute major reforms. They'll also have to deal with a police rank and file that has been operating without a contract for two years and a police union that is at odds with the current direction of the department, as you just heard. Joining us to hash out the future of the CPD are Sergio Acosta, a former assistant U.S. attorney for some 18 years and now a lawyer in private practice. Acosta was also a member of the Chicago Police Accountability Task Force. Brian Warner, a former Chicago police officer and founder of Chicago Police Survivors, a group of current and retired officers who have survived traumatic incidents. Karen Sheely, a lawyer and director of the Police Practices Project at the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois, where she is responsible for enforcing the ACLU's agreement with the City of Chicago regarding stop and frisk. And Autry Phillips, a member of the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability and executive director of the Target Area Development Corporation, a social justice organization that addresses issues, public safety, education, and violence prevention. Welcome, all of you. Sergio Acosta, you're advising Mayor uh, uh, Lightfoot here, or let's say you're advising Mayor Lightfoot on an interim <laughs> replacement. What must she look for? Well, she has to look, first of all, for a strong leader who's going to uh, maintain the course that the department is on in terms of reform, uh, but also someone who is going to be able to perhaps do a better job of persuading the rank and file that reform is the future, that that is the way the department has to go, that it's going to lead to better policing, better community relations, uh, and more success in terms of driving down crime rates. Brian Warren, we saw the names, and I don't know if we can look at that graphic again, some of the names being bandied about for uh, interim or permanent successors. Anything stand out to you? I, I think, said we spoke earlier, I think the two people that uh, were from the outside that led the department, Jody Weiss and uh, Gary McCarthy, I think those were failed experiments. I think that there's enough qualified people within the ranks right now. But I think most importantly, th th we had this conversation three years ago. I sat on this, a, a very similar panel when Eddie Johnson was, was uh, named. And we talked about, I wish that the city council, that day when they allowed Rom to just throw the process out the window and change the law for that one day and let him pick Eddie Johnson, that they would have also said, you know what, for the next four years, we're trusting this person. We've done our vetting process. This is the person we're putting our faith in, their, their skill set. For the next four years, without political influence, you have the authority to do what you knew, you and your policing statistics and strategies. So you're saying there's too much political there's influence. Way too much political influence. The person making these difficult decisions shouldn't be walk, marched into the mayor's office every Monday morning with his tail between his legs because 25 citizens shot with, with the, one another. And you, you alluded to the, the process last time Mayor Emanuel passed a basically a one-day ordinance that allowed him to circumvent the process because the police board is supposed to select three finalists, and then the mayor is supposed to pick from that. Karen Sheely, is that the process that should take place to find a new 
superintendent? Yes, and our hope is that there'll be even more um, opportunity for public input and public comment on the selection process. We had that for um, the selection of the monitor who's overseeing the consent decree, and it's important that uh, there be public trust in whoever is selected as the new superintendent because the job is going to be huge. Um, Superintendent Johnson stepped in at a really critical time, but he's leaving a department that has a huge platform of reforms that need to be accomplished. We're already behind on the consent decree. Um, we need to have a plan laid out to explain how we're going to catch up. And there are problems within the department beyond that. A, a recent report showed that the homicide unit, um, that, that, that investigations unit is just really underwater and in trouble too. Um, there's not a way to keep track of how many cases each detective has and until recently they didn't even have voicemail. And this goes to the clearance rate, the homicide clearance rate, a right. report recommending big changes. Uh, Tree Phillips, uh, public input, is that important in the process of finding a replacement? There is community engagement is essential for the next superintendent that's coming in. We have to understand that that person has to have a relationship with the people on the ground. People on the ground that works in, in, in the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability. People on the ground that's working in communities partnering for peace. The CRED program and also Ready Chicago. Those are organizations and, and grassroots organizations that's on the ground for real and dealing with the people that are dying. Brian Warner, one of the names we've heard is Charlie Beck, the former LAPD police chief that some people say could be in town as early as this weekend taking over the job on an interim basis. What about that plan? I, I don't think it makes sense. I think he was an outsider coming in. Uh, she mentioned that they, there, we have been training, Chicago has been training with LA because they were under uh, consent decree themselves. So they, they're familiar with what we're going to be experiencing. But I, I don't think it's the right choice right now. You need somebody, I said, you, you have many people. And in the past, it's always been the first deputy who steps in and takes that role in the interim until this process can play out. I, I, don't, I don't see an outsider really bringing anything to the table here. Sergio Acosta, do you have a preference between someone from within the CPD versus an outsider a la Gary McCarthy and before him Jody Weiss? Well, I think certainly it makes sense, especially on an interim basis, for it to be someone who's within the department at this time. Uh, it doesn't make sense to bring someone from the outside uh, for, for an interim job. If, you know, as far as looking at, uh, you know, a permanent replacement, I think people from outside of Chicago ought to be looked at and considered. Uh, but ultimately, I tend to agree with Brian that someone who's familiar with uh, the department, who's been here for a number of years, understands the problems, the challenges, uh, what lies ahead in terms of reforms, makes the most sense. Audrey oh, Phillips, given the fact that the DOJ had found a pattern of racism in the police department, is it important that the next person be someone of color, African American or Latino? I think the better question is, is that person willing to commit to the fact that community is important. The voice of the community is important. That the voices of the community, that are the individuals who are experiencing the losses every day, that those individuals are at the table. It doesn't matter to me personally as Archery Phillips if that person is black or brown or white. That person has to have the voice and wanted to hear and listen to the individuals who are being shot at and killed every day. Karen Chile, what are the immediate next steps that the next superintendent has to deal with regarding the consent decree? Well, the, the first next step is that we know that the department is behind on a number of the provisions um, that it, it, basically their deadlines have passed. And um, they've done a lot of work. We have to give them credit for that. But they're behind on deadlines and they haven't explained how they're going to catch up. So what we're looking for in, from the city in the short term and for, for the next superintendent in the long term is transparency and clarity about how they're going to meet the deadlines that are very aggressive in the consent decree. And going beyond that and going to what Autry said, are the, are the reforms just going to be a check the box um, set of reforms or will people in the community feel like their lives are different? That's what we want, and it's the kind of leadership that um, is really going to be needed in the next superintendent. Brian Warner, the FOP's made clear they do not like this consent decree. They've operated without a contract here for the city now for multiple years. How does this get resolved? 
The, the contract, it, that's not uncommon that the, con, that, that the contract takes two years. It, that, that's happened, I think, the last four times they've negotiated Although it doesn't contract. seem like there's any mm. path to an agreement at this point. No, I'm not familiar with where the negotiations stand, but certainly the consent decree is going to be a problem. It, technology comes into play there, too. I mean, when, when the, the department needs your, need your reactions and just goes out and buys everybody a body cam because of something and hasn't consulted the union, and with the guidelines and when that, that footage can be used, there's going to be some things that need to be hammered out. So the city needs to take a, a more slow approach instead of a knee-jerk reaction and bring the union to the table. I think there's a lot of times when, when the city reacts that they don't consider the union because the union is representing the officers and be most affected by that equipment. Um, Sergio Costa, you know, we mentioned that uh, Eddie Johnson came in in a very tumultuous time. What's the legacy he leaves behind on a number of fronts? Crime, police accountability, community relations? Well, just to you know, emphasize your point, it was a very tumultuous time. I think his legacy is, is actually going to be a, a, a pretty good one. Um, I think he brought some stability to the position, to the department, uh, in a very, uh, uh, difficult, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, the job's not done by a long shot, uh, but I think his, uh, his legacy will be a good one. Tree Phillips, has he repaired the divisions between the police department and the community, I mean, he says when he took over, the first thing that he did was to go talk to community leaders, preachers, anybody who had a stake in this and, and rebuild their trust. I remember uh, Superintendent Eddie Johnson from the 6th District when he was commander. We had a, a relationship with him that he built one-on-one -on -one relationships with the people in the Auburn Gresham community and in the Inglewood community. We thought of him as, as one of us. That's what we thought of him in Auburn Gresham. When he became the superintendent, I believe what his legacy would be, that he started the conversation with the community. And I think the individual who's actually coming after him should continue starting, continue to talk about what it is that we're doing right now. Continue on the path, working with ground root, ground individuals on the ground like CP4P. It's important that we continue that working with Reddy and working with Cred, it's important that that person who takes over for Eddie continue that because I believe that's his legacy. He started the conversation. He, he's also had to continue a new deal with the ACLU to curb stop and frisk practices. How has the department done on that under his watch? Um, it, it's been a long process. There's no question. The most recent report was released a few weeks ago, and it's still finding that there are problems within the department, especially around supervision and um, the way that, that stops are being documented. Um, a positive shift that we've seen with the new mayoral administration is that they sat down with us and hammered out a path to solve those problems instead of le leaving them languishing. So uh, we've been pleased with that. However, we are concerned that the rate of stops within um, by race is still showing vast disparities. And we disagree strongly with uh, the tape that was played earlier where uh, Eddie Johnson said, Superintendent Johnson said that uh, that could be explained just by crime. It can't. Um, and we have bigger problems that we have to deal with, with police interactions with um, especially young black men. Brian Warner, do you want to respond to that? Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to go back to what I started earlier, but I think this is, is crucial that the, the politics be taken out because we keep talking about accountability and, and, and everybody talked about over the summer having that Monday morning accountability meeting. If we take the politics out and put somebody who has the, the thought process and, and the, the ideas that Eddie Johnson had and bringing everybody to the table, but give that person the, the power to bring those groups together without the, the politics of the mayor and the alderman. So on Monday morning, now you take the mayor, you take the alderman, you take the police, the commander, and you go out into the community and say, what's going on? Yeah. Where's the accountability of you people? What, what can we all work together? We all have responsibility here. What role can we all play to solve this problem? All right we're right now, all the ills of the police, of, of, of the city, the, the broken homes, the drugs, the broken schools, all those things are being put at the foot of the police officer, and it just can't that, be. That, that is a point Superintendent Johnson made to me. He's been in the force for 31 years when he started. He said police officer was crime fighting, and now it's, it's responsible for all the ills, and it, it can't keep pace doing all that. We're out of time. I want to thank you all for joining us, and this discussion will continue. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by North Shore University Health System. Here's to the end of illness and the beginning of how healthcare should be. 
At North Shore, we're transforming your health care by analyzing your DNA to identify future health risks for you and working to stop illness before it begins. When you're a North Shore patient, your advanced primary care physician makes the latest genetic science part of your everyday care to keep you healthier longer. Advanced primary care. Here's to taking control of your health and taking on what's next. Here's more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. There are now 173 reported cases of vaping-related illness in Illinois. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Illinois Department of Public Health. Statistics released today show more than 2,000 people across the country have been diagnosed with a vaping-related lung illness. 40 people in 24 states have died, including three in Illinois. Some Republican state lawmakers are introducing a spate of ethics-related measures in response to recent corruption scandals. House Minority Leader Jim Durkin and other members of the House Republican Caucus are proposing, among other things, to ban members of the Illinois General Assembly and their families from lobbying any other governments on behalf of private clients. The move comes after former Representative Luis Arroyo resigned, facing a federal bribery charge linked to his lobbying work for gambling sweepstakes machines. And ComEd is reportedly under a federal probe for its lobbying activities in Springfield and has since cut ties with lobbyists connected to House Speaker Mike Madigan. Governor J.B. Pritzker has expressed his support for lobbying reforms as well. The early cold snap has claimed a life in Chicago. The Cook County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed a 58-year-old man died Friday partially as a result of exposure to the cold. The office says ethanol intoxication was also a contributing factor. He was pronounced dead on November 1st at First Community Medical Center, and the manner of death is ruled as an accident. And speaking of the weather, clear tonight with a low around 17 degrees. Then expect some more January-like weather tomorrow with increasingly cloudy skies and a high of only 31 degrees. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, pedestrian-friendly corners and no raised curbs. Will the shared street in Uptown be replicated elsewhere? The Bears hope to snap a four-game losing streak against the Detroit Lions on Sunday. Former Bear James Big Cat Williams previews the matchup. We go inside the headquarters of Chicago's Bloodshot Records. Champion horses, a house in Florida, and more. How a small town employee stole and spent $54 million of public money. And how the Chicago Sinfonietta reimagines Stravinsky's Firebird Suite with some help from South Asian dancers. But first, some of today's top business headlines. Here's Crane's Chicago business editor, Ann Dwyer. Paris, after an unsuccessful run for mayor of Chicago, Bill Daly has landed at Wells Fargo Bank. Daly was picked by Wells Fargo's new CEO, Charles Scharf, to oversee matters including government relations at the scandal-scarred bank. The move represents a return to the financial world for Daly, who is, of course, the son and brother of two mayors. Daly was a banker in a previous life, including a stint at J.P. Morgan Chase as well as Bank of New York Mellon, where he worked as an advisor to Scharf. One of Daly's chief responsibilities will be rebuilding trust with regulators and lawmakers who've expressed dissatisfaction with the pace of reforms at Wells Fargo. Meanwhile, real estate developer Sterling Bay is moving its headquarters to a new building in the bustling Fulton Market neighborhood. Sterling Bay helped spark a transformation of that neighborhood a few years ago, and today it announced plans to relocate its home base to a 19-story office building set to be finished soon at 333 North Green Street. Sterling Bay recently sold its current building to a venture of a German real estate firm for nearly $168 million. And finally, a bit of downbeat news for the Loop's apartment landlords. A Canadian investor is buying a stake in the apartments atop the Block 37 retail complex in the Loop. But the investor is paying far less than the valuation many observers expected. The deal for a 51% stake in the marquee at Block 37 values the building at $265 million total, or about $384,000 per unit. That's about $100,000 a unit less than what owners were seeking for a sale price earlier this year. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Ann. 
Four years ago, Argyle Street in Uptown's Little Vietnam neighborhood was dramatically reimagined. It was pitched as a shared street among pedestrians, bicyclists, and cars. Concept backers cited as a success in places like Seattle and Brighton, England. The shared street designation began as a pilot program and was recently made permanent by the Chicago City Council. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg has more on how the shared street is working. Construction on Argyle between Broadway and Sheridan began in summer 2015 and ran through summer 2016. There have been some tweaks along the way, and this being Chicago, there's a different construction project right now tied to the CTA's red line overhaul. But 48th Ward Alderman Harry Osterman, who backed the streetscape project, calls it a success. What we want to do is create a roadway and a street that kind of slowed people down in cars, encouraged outdoor cafes for the great restaurants, and had people come and spend money here. So what we found is that people are driving slower. Um, the businesses have opened up a lot of outdoor cafes in the summertime. Um, from Broadway to Sheridan Road, there's probably 15 of them. And we do a street festival every Thursday night called the Argyle Night Market. The raised curbs along Argyle were removed, making the street all one level. Corners were made more pedestrian friendly with barriers. The standard issue asphalt got an aesthetic upgrade. Rain wells with trees and shrubs catch runoff and create breaks along the street. The construction part was difficult, like with any construction project. Um, but I think once it's been, a, it's uh, once we've had it in place, it's been great because we did lots of education. Uh, when you're changing people's parking patterns and driving patterns, um, it's a challenge. Features like the bump outs at the crosswalk, the single level street, the pavers make Argyle feel unlike most others in Chicago. But for the most part, people treat it just like any other street. Pedestrians on the sidewalk, cars and bikes in the roadway. Aaron Hung co-owns the coffee shop First Sip Cafe on Argyle, which opened in 2017. I think we all kind of agree with the vision of what it could be and, you know, how like to make it more community and for people to encourage people to walk around. Um, but I think a lot of the residents and the businesses around here just notice how long and painful that process was. Hung's also concerned that in a community with many immigrants who may not speak English well, some residents don't get a say on major projects. For his part, Osterman says his office did and does make a concerted effort to reach out in multiple languages. I think everyone still sees this as like a two-way regular street and not a shared streetscape, let's say like Lincoln Square. I think a lot of shared streetscapes end up having lights at the top to zigzag back and forth or some kind of flags to unify the both sides. So I think if we were to do something like that, I think that would also help. Whether or not there are any further tweaks coming, Osterman's bullish about Argyle's future and its adaptability in other parts of town. This is the first one that was done in Chicago, but I don't think it'll be the last. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. The city's transportation department says there are no current plans to replicate Argyle's shared street model, but noted that the Fulton Market streetscape under construction is also designed without curbs with an eye toward accommodating street markets in much warmer weather than this. Well, the Bears take on the Detroit Lions on Sunday in a divisional matchup. Both struggling teams are looking to avoid being last place in the NFC North. Is this the week the Bears finally get it going on offense and snap a four? I'm seeing... People shaking their heads in the studio. <laughs> Snap a four-game losing streak. <laughs> joining us, joining us with a preview of the matchup is James Big Cat Williams, former Bears offensive lineman. All right, Big Cat Williams, I, I, you, te you tend not to be a, a skeptical guy. Can, is, the, is the Detroit Lions defense the tonic that the Bears offense needs right now? It could be. It could be. You look at you know what Mitch has been able to do in the past against the Detroit Lions last year he had one of his best games uh, three touchdowns in the air one running touchdown in one game and he just he needs this the Bears need this they they need to as an organization as a team they need to get it all together 
all areas of football operations need to perform at their highest peak and they need to get a win. Yeah, three and five is kind of like the breaking point. It's hard to make the playoffs. The Bears had only two first downs and nine net yards in the first half. Have you ever even seen that before? Unfortunately, I played on a <laughs> Bears team that went up to San Francisco and did not cross the 50 yard line. Oh man. So yeah, I, I understand and I know how bad it is to go in at halftime and feel like everything you do doesn't work, you know, but to be able to come out in the second half and try and pull it back together, and they were able to a little bit, and a lot of that had to do with play calling, but you think about that first half, and it was just, it was just a show of mistakes. Was it just play calling in the second half that improved things? I mean, there were a couple long passes that Trubisky hit. Yeah, but I think it, it all had to do with play calling. They went back. You look at the first play of the game and they come out and they run the I formation. And then you don't see it again until after halftime. Um, I understand that they had a limited amount of plays in the first half. I think they only ran 15 plays total in the first half. But they came out in the second half. They lined up in those formations. They ran the ball a little bit. They did what we asked them to do as far as doing a little bit of play action like you just saw, a little naked, a little bootleg rollout. You know, these are the things that they need to be doing right now. These are the things that will make things a little bit easier on Mitch, um, enabling him to, you know, maybe read a half a field, get some play action, get those linebackers to step up in towards the line of scrimmage and open some things up for him and he just has to complete it. What are the things in Detroit's defense the Bears could expose, you think? Well, I think, you know, you're talking about trying to take advantage of that Detroit secondary. You know, if, if Mitch is able to throw some passes on cue, um, not overthrow, not underthrow, guys have been open. You know what I mean? So it's it's about the offensive line being able to hold their blocks, to be able to give Mitch some time. It's about play calling, putting them in the right situations to to make some plays, both running the ball and throwing the ball. And Mitch has to hit his throws. You know, this reminds me of the Bears played the Lions at home last year. Trubisky had maybe his best game ever right. as a pro, 148 uh, passer rating. What, what's What's happened between now and then? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the playbook just got a little too complicated. And if it did, that, that falls on everybody. That falls on Mitch. That falls on Nagy. You've got to simplify things for him. You know, if, if, it's the, if the fact is that he's not able to read defenses at the line of scrimmage, that hurts the entire team. And it's not just something that we see on TV. It's something that guys will feel in the huddle. It's something guys recognize at the line of scrimmage. You know, you have a young rookie center in there, and if at times he's not able to turn the line the right way to get them into protections to keep the quarterback safe, it's up to the quarterback to get it done. How do the Bears' defense, which is depleted without Akeem Hicks on the line, how do they match up with the Detroit offense? Well, I think going into this game, it's not so much about the Detroit offense. The Bears' defense just has to get back to playing what they would consider Bears football. Uh, they have to be able to put pressure on Stafford so that he does not have time to sit back in the pocket and, you know, find his receivers, find Jones, find, you know, they've got a rookie tight end. I'm not even sure if he's going to play this week, but they have players on their team that can make big plays. And if you give Stafford time, he will pick you apart. Does so. it seem like... Khalil Mack's been struggling lately. You just don't hear his name called as much the last few games. Well, I think teams have been play paying a lot more attention to him. Uh, you go back to the Oakland game where Oakland came out and they weren't scared to run the ball at him. They brought an extra lineman in. They chipped him with tight ends. They chipped him with backs out of the backfield. They cracked back on him with wide receivers. So when you're being paid that much attention to, your game's going to struggle a little bit. But it's the job of the other guys, Floyd, you know, Goldman, if he's a, a, able to play. Um, you know, these guys, Roquan Smith, all these guys have to now step up and fill those shoes. All right, quickly, your bold prediction for this week. All right, I'm going back to the Bears because, <laughs> you know, I, I'm hoping they're able to put some points on the board. So. I said you're an optimistic guy. Yeah, yeah, so we're going to go 24-21, go Bears over Detroit. Close game, all right. Close game. 
Well, you heard Big Cat's bold prediction for the game. What's yours? Let us know on our website or social media. And while on our website, you can read Big Cat's three takes to beating the Lions. Next week, Big Cat will join us to preview the Bears matchup with the L.A. Rams. It's the silver anniversary of a Chicago independent record label that sets the gold standard for roots music in the city and beyond. Bloodshot Records started out on the fringes of the music scene and staked a claim with rock and country shot through with punk and soul. We visited their headquarters on the eve of their 25th anniversary and got an earful. Jay Shevsky has the story. I am a big town. That a monster's on the prowl. At Bloodshot Records, John Langford bangs out a new song about his adopted hometown. And now the sharp end is coming round, and I must clutch it to my breast. The veteran rocker from Wales says he'd been burned by record labels before his long relationship with Bloodshot. Now, I will say, Bloodshot were the first people who ever sent me a royalty check. I was, I was completely baffled because I had a. Uh, a check for something like $39 or something. It was, a, it was a, unusual for everything before that in the music industry. Being, yeah, you have to scratch and beg for money, but they, they, they willingly sent me a check. <laughs> I love Bloodshot Record. <laughs> The label's music ranges from country blues hey, boy, do you wanna make love? to soulful rock. Here's the late Mr. Rhythm, Andre Williams, at WTTW with John Langford on guitar. So where are the honky-tonks in Chicago? And they do straight-up honky-tonk. We were seeing all these bands around town at tiny little clubs that didn't necessarily know about one another that were all touching on roots music in some weird way and kind of operating independently of one another and just very organically creating this, this sound. And we thought, well, here's a good place for us to stitch it together and kind of make a scene out of it and give it a name and some kind of identity. It's been called alt-country, insurgent country, even y'alternative. Sometimes it's pure party music. Bloodshot could not have happened anywhere else other than Chicago. Chicago is not a company town. It's not New York, it's not LA, it's not Nashville. There's not people trying to get signed every night. They're not trying to impress a &R people. They're not trying to be pop stars. They're doing what they're doing in a very free and open way. In 25 years, Bloodshot has released 300 records, including early LPs by Nico Case and Ryan Adams, and later recordings by music vets Graham Parker and Alejandro Escovedo. It all started with a compilation of unsigned local bands. We figured it out as we went. We did not look beyond that first compilation of Chicago bands, and as as that rolled out, we realized that we had touched a nerve uh, around the country. People from Dallas and St. Louis and San Francisco, New York were starting to call us and say, hey, we've got a few bands like that around here and no one's doing anything with it. They came up to me and said they were making an album of country music um, and would I like to be on it? Did I have a song? It was as simple as that. They asked me to write a song and I did. Now there's a team of six full-time employees to bring in the latest stock from Chicago vinyl maker Smashed Plastic and to manage the merch. Like any independent shop, they just want you to value what they do. If you profess to love independent music, you as a fan need to support it because no one's getting rich here. Uh, everyone exists on the fringes and we're doing it for a very basic love of it, but the economic model is largely unsustainable. We're absolutely foolhardy to continue to do it. <laughs> no one knows anybody here. I am a big town. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. The alternative, I like that. Bloodshot Records celebrates their 25th anniversary this week with a new recording called Too Late to Pray, Defiant Chicago Roots. And there's a record release party with live music this Saturday at Workshop 4200, which is also the home of Chicago's smashed plastic vinyl record company that's been recently featured here on Chicago Tonight.
You can find those stories and more on Bloodshot Records on our website. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. Dixon, Illinois. It's a small town about 100 miles west of Chicago, known as the boyhood home of former President Ronald Reagan. But it's also now known for one of the most outrageous cases of municipal fraud in modern times. Former Dixon Comptroller Rita Cronwell was convicted for stealing $54 million from the town over a period of 20 years. Now a documentary airing tonight on WTTW attempts to find out how she got away with it for so long. Here's a look with former town leaders describing the day of Cronwell's arrest. That morning I went into the mayor's office. I said, Jim, I can't do this anymore. And he just looked up at me and he said, Kathy, today's the day. So I just called her on the intercom and I said, Rita, could you stop up here? And she said, sure. She came down the hall. I couldn't look at her because I knew right then and there they were already in the office waiting for her. So she came up the door and she said, yes, sir. I said, Rita, these gentlemen would like to ask you a few questions. And she said, sure. And I was looking right at her face. Her countenance never changed at all. So with that, I exited the office. And then just like that, there's like about 15 of them came into City Hall, come right upstairs, and they shut City Hall down. That's a clip from the documentary, All the Queen's Horses. And joining us now is director-producer Kelly Richmond Pope, who's also an associate professor at DePaul's Accounting School. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Thanks for having me. I can't believe this story is already seven years old. I remember it hit like a bombshell. What made you want to do this film? Well, I teach a lot of my accounting classes with film and TV, so that may sound odd, but it makes it interesting. Mm. And um, when I read the headlines, City Comptroller at that time embezzles $30 million, I was shocked. And I first said, where's Dixon? And I thought, someone needs to tell this story about how it happened. So. I just started reading, started going back and forth to Dixon, and was mesmerized by it. And remind us uh, who Rita Cronwell is. So she was the city comptroller for 20 years, so she's the person that maintained the money. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was it, eventually she was convicted on a $54 million scheme. How did this scheme work? It was a really simple scheme. So she really just moved money from one account to the next, and no one knew it. So there was a capital development fund, and she would take money from that account and move it into her, her secret account and then just shop and buy horses. And she would kind of create sham invoices for capital projects that never happened. I mean, how was she able to get away with doing that? Well, it was pretty easy for her because she had the absolute control and no one paid any attention to what she did. So it was simple to create these sham invoices. And how did the FBI first catch wind of this? From a whistleblower. Mm. So the whistleblower by the name of Kathy Swanson is how all of this came to light. One day Kathy noticed that there was this account that had some deposits and withdrawals coming out of it and she let her boss know. So it was discovered by a whistleblower. And, but 20 years after this fraud scheme first started, so how do you think that she was able to get away with this without anyone detecting it for so long? Well, I think um, it's common for the person that controls the money, everyone trusts that person. So right. no one else is, no one ever really wants to do that job. It's the accountant, it's the finance person. So no one asked a lot of questions. Whatever Rita said is what they did. So it made it easy for her to get away with this for a really long time. And you alluded to this, she, she lived a lavish lifestyle. She was a champion horse breeder. She had horses worth in the six figures. Was that not a red flag, the lifestyle she was living? Well, I think it is, but what are you going to do with that information? So who are you going to ask? If you think that your neighbor lives this lavish lifestyle and has horses and cars and throws lavish parties, who are you going to report it to? So I think it was a red flag, but I just don't think people knew what to do with the information. When we talk about $54 million pilfered from the city budget over 20 years. What was the real world impact on that town and its residents? Well, I think that there were city projects that didn't get, um, there were city projects that never happened. Um, the uh, swimming pool never opened. Um, no one really, uh, 
No one died as a result of the stealing of the money, but there were just town activities that didn't take place as a result of the money being gone. So roads not being paved, um, police not having all the equipment that they need. So just things like that, just the regular functions of a town not happening on and a normal basis. When you went to interview residents in Dixon, what was the general tenor of the residents and their reaction? Well, when I first started going to Dixon, that's when all the media outlets were there. So people were really talking. But as I kept going and the media outlets left, people just got tired of talking about it. So I think mm -hmm. at one point they got tired of seeing me there a lot. But um, towards the end, um, people were just saying, you know, is there something else we can talk about? But um, it was, they were shocked, but they were relieved. They were relieved that someone was trying to tell the story to explain how this could happen. Because one of the things I always wanted to show through the film is this isn't a Dixon story. Right. This isn't anywhere, any place, anybody story. Well, is, is, is a small town like Dixon particularly susceptible to something like this where perhaps there, there isn't the level of oversight that there would be in a bigger city? So I, think, I don't think the town size matters. I think the issue is trust. And you trust people in a small town, medium town, or a large town, or a small organization, large, it doesn't matter. It's the idea of trust. So I don't think the size of the town made it more susceptible than a large city. I'm sure there's plenty of fraud in large cities all around the country. And you mentioned in the film, you know, there were auditors that regularly checked the books of Dixon. Why weren't they able to detect this? Well, one of the things that we uh, tell students um, that we still teach is an audit is not designed to find fraud. It's not that you can't find it, but it's not designed to do that. So you're not looking at every transaction. So things can slip through. Uh, one of the jobs of the auditors is to say, are your internal controls working? Do you have sound internal controls? They can say that, and I think that from some of the information that I reviewed during the film, the auditors did let them know that there was a weakness within their internal controls. But that's the responsibility of management to fix that. So these auditors, um, there's, there is blame to go around, but um, I think there's, a, there's blame to share between the city council and the auditor. And city council and the current, the mayor at that time had, had certainly gotten an earful from residents after this had all happened. Uh, the residents wanted to just kind of clean house. What was the political fallout? Well, one of the things that happened, um, the mayor decided not to run again, um, and that was uh, Mayor Burke has passed away. Um, and they changed their form of government. So now they have a city manager form of government. So that was one of the fallouts after all this happened. And, and the FBI has, had tried to recover a lot of the assets. I mean, selling off the horses. She had a house in Florida. How much money has, has Dixon recovered? Oh, to, to date, um, I believe Dixon has recovered around $11 million um, from selling off the assets. And then in a civil suit, they received $40 million. Oh, so, the, so, so they're almost back to even. And what, because in the movie you mentioned that they had a budget deficit. To, ha, have they fixed some of their budgetary problems? Um, I believe so. so. It's been about two years since I've been back to Dixon. Um, at that time, when the money started coming in, I believe that their um, debt issues have been resolved. Did you try and contact uh, Rita Crunwell? Uh, I mean, she's in prison, and, and how did that go? Well, I would um, think that I'm probably not a person she wants to hear from <laughs> because not everyone gets a movie made about their life. But yes, um, I have reached out to her. I have written to her, and um, she did have a family member reach out to me after I sent this letter to her because I really do. I'd love to talk to her. I think that she's a very fascinating person, and um, I have a few questions that I'd love to ask her. What's the takeaway for, for small towns? How do they guard against this kind of fraud? Well, I think the takeaway is really for anyone. Just make sure that if trust is your internal control, beware, because you need to ask questions. Um, if you think something seems suspicious, keep asking questions, because oftentimes, those questions could lead to a really dangerous or really serious answer. You know, if you had interviewed Rita Cronwell, I'm sure one of the questions you'd want to ask her is, why? Why did you do this? Why do you think she did it? Well, I think she did it because um, she loved horses, and I think she could get away with it. I think she realized that no one was paying attention. But if I ever interviewed her, I would ask her, did you ever think someone was close to catching you? Because it's that uneasy feeling that a lot of times we have when we are keeping a secret. And I just want to know, how did you sleep at night? Did you ever get scared that someone was on to you? I'm sure a lot of residents would like to know that too. Kelly Richmond Pope, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.
And the documentary All the Queen's Horses has its WTTW premiere tonight at 8 following Chicago Tonight. And you can visit our website to see the rest of the air dates. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. An orchestra that bills itself as the nation's most diverse is working to push the boundaries of how classical music is presented by incorporating dance. This weekend, the Chicago Sinfonietta will present Love and Light, the jubilant return of Diwali. It's a five-day celebration that happens every year between October and November. With the help of a few South Asian dancers, they'll share the story of the Hindu Festival of Lights and how good triumphs over evil. Chicago Tonight's arts correspondent Angel Ido reports. It's not often that you see dancers accompany orchestra ensembles, but for the Chicago Sinfonietta, it's a great way to add another dimension to classical music. In a two-night-only concert, dancers with the Mandala South Asian Performing Arts School will join the Chicago Sinfonietta on stage for their second annual Diwali concert celebration. The orchestra will play Igor Stravinsky's Firebird Suite, but with a bit of a twist. I thought of the idea of doing the Firebird, and I said, you know, this, this piece has a lot to do with uh, light over darkness, good over evil, and very often we might see this work danced by class, what we call Western classical trained dancers. I said, what if we were to reimagine this story and use uh, traditional South Asian dance and use this music as a foundation and tell the story of Diwali, but using Stravinsky's music um, as the background for it. Together, conductor Samir Patel worked with choreographer Ashwati Shanat to bring the sense of community the holiday celebrates to the stage. Diwali is practiced throughout South Asia and within the diaspora. It's practiced by many different faiths, um, which makes it a very diversely celebrated holiday and an important one to share. The Festival of Light celebration will also feature world famous South Indian musician Dr. L. Supermaniam in the North American premiere of his concerto Shanta Priya. It's a piece he says captures the perfect blend of celebration, prayer, and reflection. The Chicago Sinfonietta hopes the unique stories they share will leave the audience feeling open minded. Having the possibility to just hold up a different lens to this work and see it in a new, fresh context, and in this case with Indian traditional dance, adds a new dimension to the piece. It becomes a conversation. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And you can celebrate the Festival of Lights this Saturday at the Wentz Concert Hall in Naperville, and then again on Monday at the Symphony Center. There's more information on our website. And that is our show for this Thursday night. Please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. And we leave you tonight with more from John Langford and Bloodshot Records. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Search lights on a rooftop. Pick out all the promise in my hands. Stretching out on the horizon. I have the gift, I have the plans. I am a big town. There are monsters on the prowl, banging round, crashing round. Hanging in the air, there's trouble everywhere. Tear me down, tear me down, tear me down. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives. In the blood-soaked black streets of a memory, move along, there's nothing here for you.